Good morning, folks. Any lingering questions about Lab 3? It being the last day, I figured there probably wouldn't be too many questions. We need to start talking about Lab 4. I'm a little bit behind here because of fall break, but uh, Lab 4 is primarily a hardware lab. There is some software, of course, because there always is. But the, the major part of the lab will be building a motor driver, building the physical helicopter, if you will, and uh, getting all of the feedback working with reasonably low noise. So we need to talk about motors, DC motors, and that leads us directly to isolation, electrical isolation, because DC motors, uh, as I'll try and, and motivate, are extraordinarily noisy. And we need to talk about optimal control, or li optimal linear control at least, uh, PID algorithms, proportional integral differential controller as a way of, of stabilizing a, a controller and making it more accurate. And we need to talk a little bit about output compare units, which are what generates a, a PWM signal we're going to be using to drive the motor. And we're going to use PWM and not proportional control because it's inefficient to have FET switches operate in class A mode. You know what I mean by class A? Proportional mode? You want it to be switches. You want it to be on or off. So, <clears throat> I think I've barely uh, talked about the actual lab. I don't, have I talked much about this? I don't think so. I'm watching, I'm going to, you, you, I think I showed you the, uh, the video of the thing, so I'm not going to do that again. But you're going to need to write a, a thread and an interrupt service routine. And the reason that I'm asking you to put a calculation in the interrupt service routine, although last, in the last lab I jumped up and down and said don't put, state machines in the interrupt service routine. I'm going to want you to put a, a fairly simple calculation in an interrupt service routine that actually calculates the, the PID control uh, algorithm based on an ADC reading. The interrupt only has to run at about a kilohertz the time constant of the beam, if you have a beam a foot long, the time constant of the beam, the free swinging pendulum time constant is like a half a second. And the motor time constant is on the order of dozens of milliseconds. So a <coughs> PWM rate of a kilohertz is reasonable in terms of the motor dynamics and the, and the pendulum dynamics. But what I mean by reasonable here is that if you switch on a control, on and off a control a thousand times a second, the motor time constant and the, and the inertia of the propeller is going to average it out to a constant speed. So it's fast enough. You're going to read the ADC in the interrupt service routine, calculate the PID control loop as fast as possible. When I did this, I didn't, uh, not only did I not use floating point, I didn't even use fixed point, I used integer arithmetic. And I'll show you why that, that, that's easy to do in this case, but not right now. Then you're going to set up a, you're going to set a PWM uh, signal using an output compare unit to control the motor. So, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. So you're going you're to set up a, an output compare unit to do the PWM in hardware so you don't have to time microsecond accuracy let the hardware do that. Then you're going to write two channels of the DAC with two different values. You're going to write a value proportional to the actual beam angle, the, the angle of the, of the lever, and a second channel with the motor control signal. This is the voltage that you're generating or a signal proportional to the voltage that you're generating through the output compare unit. So, 
it is important. This is not something you do, these two channels are not something you do the last day to get ready for the demo. Oh, we've got to get that going. That's what you do first so you can debug the damn thing. Okay, this is hard to get running. And so you need to know what the, the beam is actually doing and what the controller is doing so that you can that you can debug it. So these are the like the first things you write for the interrupt service routine, not the last things. And then you're going to uh, and then there's going to be uh, another thread of control is going to be a thread that allows the user to take the PID parameters and set them up. You could do a parameter entry system like you did for lab two using the keypad and the TFT. But I was thinking it might be more fun to go to a different selection system, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then there's going to be another thread which just updates the LCD maybe 10 times a second or maybe a little bit slower. Any questions on the concurrency? Angle sensor is a 10K potentiometer. It's expensive because it's low torque. There are three leads on a potentiometer, as you know. You want to put a series resistor on the middle, on the uh, variable one, and this 100K resistor will work for that. This is set up to be a low pass filter. Since this is a 10K resistor, putting 100K here means that this resistance is irrelevant with respect to the RC time constant. And that's why I chose 100K. But you want to choose C so that the bandwidth is appropriate for the control system. What does that mean? It's got to be below a kilohertz, which is the PWM frequency. And it's got to be above the time constant, it's got to be faster than the time constant of the motor. These little motors have a time constant which is much smaller than the time constant of the beam itself. So you're going to want to make this something like two, three, four milliseconds, something like that. And that'll get rid of some of the high frequency noise and the spike noise and other junk. And then you're going to want to put this directly into one of the ADC channels like you did with the potentiometer in lab three. It is a good idea when you get this thing hooked up to the ADC to put a scope on here and see what the waveform looks like. Is it noisy? Is it clean? Does it need more low pass filtering? The motor is a tiny little uh, lift motor from a quadcopter kit. It's a DC motor, it's a brush DC motor. You hook it up one way, it turns this way. You hook it up the other way, it turns the other way. Or you hook up the polarity, the reverse. So when you're actually building the motor assembly, you don't need to worry much about the polarity because you can always just change the wires around and make the propeller turn the other direction. <laughs> First time I did, first two times I did it, I had it pushing itself down into the table so it didn't take off very well. But it didn't hurt anything. Now there's, there's a bunch of stuff, things you need to put on the motor to, to protect the CPU from the motor. And the reason for this is that motors are really noisy like really noisy. So when you turn on, let's say if we have time versus voltage across the motor, you turn on the, you turn on a switch, the motor starts to turn and it produces a constant RF noise, 
with a bandwidth of above 100 kilohertz until you open the switch at which point the voltage across the motor changes polarity because the model for the motor what that we're going to use is a resistor an inductor and a generator you cut off the current suddenly what does the inductor do? Uh, voltage rises across it. Right, in fact, the voltage reverses and becomes really big. What's the voltage across an inductor? L times di dt, right? Remember that from, <sighs> from 2100? Or someplace, LDIT. L here is millihenries. Let's say let's say ten to the minus three henries. L is equal to maybe ten to the minus three. It's probably actually bigger than that, but let's be conservative. What's DIDT? Let's say that, that you're drawing about an amp through this motor. Okay, that'll it'll 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 take an amp, and you turn off that amp in. 10 nanoseconds. It's a pretty fast switch we're using, a fast FET. What's DIDT? Numerically. What? 10 to the 8th, right. So DIDT is 10 to the 8th amps per second. Hmm, multiply those together, we get, oh God, 100,000 volts. That's not good for FETs. So we have to make sure that we make sure that the voltage never gets very high to protect the FET. It'll certainly get too high if you just have the motor and the FET in series. It'll blow the FET right into the sky. It'll turn it back into sand. So what you do is you put a snubber diode across the motor. Snubber, it, it snubs the voltage. It, uh, it shorts it out when the when the voltage is reversed. So when this end goes negative, goes positive, the current flows. And the only thing you have to worry about for this diode is that the, that the diode is physically big enough to absorb the energy in the motor without burning up. <coughs> and we're going to use 1N4001s. They're pretty big physically so they can absorb some heat. Um, and these have polarity. You could put them in wrong. And what will be the symptom when you put it in backwards? The motor won't run. That's true. What's the other symptom? Dead giveaway. You touch this and you go, ow, that's hot. All right, it'll probably actually burn you if you put it in backwards. Because this thing is a diode way up past 100 degrees C. So, if this diode is hot, you messed up. Turn it around. <clears throat> the capacitor here shorts out the RF. The motor is generating a tremendous amount of RF, mostly in this EMF generator here. I suppose you could say. <clears throat> it's actually in the brushes. You're going to short, you're going to put this across the motor so it acts like a short circuit for high frequency does nothing for DC. It doesn't short the circuit to DC. It just gets rid of a lot of the high frequency. So this protects the CPU from the RF from the motor. But we need more. In fact, we need to completely optically isolate the CPU side from the motor side. So there is no shared ground. There is no shared wire between the two sides. There's going to be a 300 ohm resistor on an I.O. pin. Which I.O. pin? Well, that depends on how you set up PPS for the output compare unit that you choose to use. There's one through five. <clears throat> and that's going to be in series with a light emitting diode, which is inside an integrated circuit. It's called a 4N35. It has 
<clears throat> excuse me, it has a light emitting diode and it has a phototransistor in the package. So you are going to hook this ground to MCU ground and you're not going to hook anything on this side to MCU ground or MCU power at all. But rather, you're going to power it from the 6 volt bench supply. <coughs> There's a 6 volt output and a 20 volt output on the bench supply. Use the 6 volt output because it has higher current capability. And don't, but don't set it to 6 volts. I'm not sure whether you'll burn up this motor or not at 6 volts. The motor is rated, the motor is rated at an average value of 3.7 volts, which happens to be the battery, uh, the, 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 the voltage of a lithium ion cell. So set this to 3.7 or 4 or maybe 4 and a half, but not 6 volts. If everything is built correctly, then the beam should hover, it should become neutral weight at around 2.7 volts applied voltage or so. This is set up as a emitter follower. Remember emitter follower? Ooh, we're at 3140. Emitter follower, so it's a non-inverting transistor current amplifier. And that's just driving the gate of a, of a uh, MOSFET. What every student asks is, what's the value of this resistor and what's the value of that capacitor? And the answer is, it's not clear. You might have to experiment with this. This should probably be around 0.1 microfarads. This should probably be around 1 mega ohm. However, this resistor is connected to a, a photo base, right? This is a light sensitive base on this transistor. And so the photo current generated can, can, is generated very quickly, but can only leak off through this resistor. So this resistor sets the bandwidth of the opto isolator. You set it too low, if you make this too low, not enough photo current will be generated to turn on the transistor to get it to 0.7 volts above ground. If you set it too high, the transistor will be too slow and the pulse width modulator won't work. So you need to set it probably around a meg ohm. Start with a meg ohm and see what happens. See if the PWM works. Scope, scope this point and see what the waveform looks like. Oh, when you do that, by the way, you have to move the ground of the oscilloscope from MCU ground to motor ground. And you're not going to hook up one channel. You're not going to hook up one channel of the oscilloscope ground to MCU ground and the other one to motor ground because that wrecks the isolation. That's a shared ground now. <clears throat> so you're going to check, now this whole thing, you could have one of your members of your team build and test. You could substitute, well you could put the motor there, or you could just put a resistor in here. How big a resistor? Hmm, 5 ohms. And, and test this circuit and see if you can control it with the pulse width modulator that you can generate from the signal generator that we have. You don't need the CPU to generate a PWM signal. You can do that with the signal generator. With a, so it has a duty cycle control. <clears throat> so you can test this whole circuit with no software.
Can we go back to the angle sensor? I wanted to ask about the op amp. Sure. So what is that actually doing? So it's a follower. It's an impedance. It's an impedance matcher. So this is a set up as a unity gain follower. So <coughs> the characteristic impedance of the signal at this point is about 100 k ohms, right? Because of this 100 k ohm series resistor here. So 100 k ohms is too high to get good bandwidth out of the ADC because you will remember from the last lab uh, workup that one of the steps in the ADC is to charge a small capacitor in the sample and hold circuitry. So when this switch closes we have to charge this capacitor in about 60 nanoseconds. If you have a large series resistance then you can't charge it fast enough so you have to lower the output impedance of this circuit and the emitter follower or the, the uh, unity gain follower lowers this impedance to around a hundredth of an ohm or so. So this is an impedance lowerer to make the ADC happy. <clears throat> Any other questions? So you need to build this, you need to get the sensor running. Remember, these poten potentiometers are over $20 each, you get one. You break it, you're going to make an order to DigiKey. So, going to build these two things. Then you have to build, the, oh, I, I, I wrote a little MATLAB simulator which matches the behavior of the system pretty well. You might want to play with that. You need to build this beam. Little motor on the end at right angles to the potentiometer. You want to route this wire to minimize friction and minimize weight. I use two strands of a ribbon cable. If you peel them apart, then you have to figure out how to get them back together again because because when you peel them apart as you run them down the stick they're going to make more induced noise into the sensor circuit than if you leave them together. Sp spurious capacitances are going to kill you in this lab. There's some details on how to build that before you build it. Before you take file to, 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 to a bracket, read all the steps. Then at the output, the data display, we're going to require look something like this where the top trace is the actual position, the actual angle. So I asked for a step in angle and got something that hopped up and then oscillated a little bit and then f settled down. And the motor control signal looks like this. So you're going to want to see something like that when you actually do the, do the, uh, when, you're, when you're running the system. The So, there's various aspects of this which, which make it interesting. So you got this beam, so there's a pivot, you got some motor sitting out here. I linearized it, linearized it around the horizontal position. I, in other words, I called this zero degrees. So and this is a plus, plus angle. That's a minus angle. And there's two strong nonlinearities. One is that the thrust, thrust is proportional to the voltage squared that you apply to the motor. So turning up the thrust a little bit 
So turning up the motor a little bit increases the thrust a lot. That makes it a little hard to control. The other thing that makes it hard to control is as soon as you get away from the horizontal, as soon as you get away from the horizontal, if the, if the motor is at constant speed, the torque required to hold it at a given angle becomes less because the projection in the horizontal plane is less. And so until you get to vertical where it takes zero torque to hold it vertically, right, it's balanced. And so the whole system becomes more sensitive to the motor as you go to high angle. You have to control it faster and more accurately as you go to higher and higher angle. <coughs> I am, that is why the specification for the lab is that you are going to start this thing at, horizontal, at vertical down. You're going to run it up to zero. Anything in this quadrant is differentially stable. In other words, you keep the motor constant speed, it'll stay there. Anything in this quadrant is differentially unstable. If you keep the motor constant, it'll fly away. You run up to here, then you run it to plus 30 degrees, then you run it to minus 30 degrees, then back to horizontal. And you're going to be graded on that waveform. So, where did I, I put an example of that waveform down here someplace? Yeah, four angles. So, this was the result of about two weeks of fiddling with the control circuitry. So, starts at minus 90. I hit reset. The f thing fires off, goes to zero with one, a couple of little glitches there. Then hops up to plus 30. Drops to minus 30 jumps back to zero and there's about a half a cycle of overshoot on each of these steps which is close to optimal settling time. You want about a half a cycle of overshoot for optimum settling time for making it go fast. But and you can see then when the angles were when the angles were very far off there was a step in the control here the motor really kicked on and then when I asked for it to drop it kicked off and then kicked back on again because it fell past the control point. <coughs> so you're going to probably find this useful for for debugging but why did I limit it to plus 30 and minus 30? Hmm. Sine theta equals theta for small angles, right? Remember the Taylor expansion for sine theta? First term is x, second term is x cubed. So, so for small angle, sine theta equals theta. And you can ask yourself, how far off? And, and that's going to be something like the nonlinearity and, and, and torque drop due to angle. So how far off is the control, or is the linearity, how far off of sine theta equals theta is 30 degrees? Oh, let's see, 30 degrees is uh, half a radian. What's the sine of half a radian? Somebody must have a calculator out. Is it one half? It's actually a, 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 a little less than that, but it turns out it's within 5%. So, so it's good enough up to 30 degrees. You don't get too much of a torque uh, problem with increasing angle at 30 degrees. That's why I said it there. Try to make it easier. We are going to ask you, so there's going to be, when this thing boots up, when you turn on the switch, it should hop to zero, go to 30, go to minus 30, back to zero, and, and, and keep running. And then at that point, we can ask you to set an arbitrary angle and it should go to that angle. We can ask you to change the PID parameters. There's going to be three PID par parameters, which I haven't talked about yet. There's going to be a proportional gain, the proportional part. There's going to be an integral gain. 
and there's going to be a differential gain. And I'll talk about this next time, Monday. But proportional term is going to be proportional to the error between what you set, what you command, what you desire in terms of angle and the actual angle. So you're going to get a you're going to get a signal which is proportional to the error. You're going to get a signal which is proportional to the integral of the error and a signal which is proportional to the first derivative of the error. Why these signals? Well, you start off down here, the angle, the, the error is large. You have a, if you have a, a large gain, it's going to turn the motor on full. The motor is going to accelerate. It's going to get to zero and it's going to go right on by and keep climbing because it's going too fast. In fact, the first two or three times I did this, the arm went, yeah, wham, and ran into my desk and once into my hand, which hurt but didn't cut me. By the way, student was testing that yesterday, ran the, ran the RPM up to about 14,000 RPM, put his finger into the blade, and the blade disappeared. Poof. Where'd it go? And it had, it, had, it had bounced off of the shaft and flew across the room. Maybe you ought to wear your safety glasses when you're doing this. So, <clears throat> I bought 12 new pairs. So uh, you're going to actually you're going to want to put a stop on this thing so it won't fall over, right? But what the system needs to be able to do is to predict how fast it's going to be going when it when it crosses zero error, and it, you want to you want to have this thing predict where it is so it can stop at zero error. What is the best linear predictor of a function? The first derivative. So you're going to have a term which is differential which allows the system to predict where it's going to be after a certain amount of time and you can turn down the motor if the error is decreasing rapidly you would like to turn down the motor more than you would expect from a from a strictly proportional term so the differential term is going to be allow you to the system to predict and you're going to find you need a very large derivative term to make this system stable The integral term, I'm doing, this, I'm doing this qualitatively now, I'm going to do it quantitatively in the next lecture starting from the equations of motion of the motor. So, so, but the integral term is going to, is going to ha the integral gain is going to be rather small, so you ta it takes a rather large integral to, to trigger it, and when that's going to what that when that's going to happen is you have the system commanded to be at minus 30 degrees it's almost at minus 30 or almost at plus 30 and but it's a little bit low and so over time the integral grows because the error is constant small but constant and as the integral grows you use that signal to push the desired position in the correct direction. So there's going to be a differential term to predict where the system is going to be at high speed and there's going to be an integral term to correct it at low speed, at steady state. So there's going to be a steady state correction, this is going to be uh, a transient correction. And you need both to make this thing work. So the primary, 
the primary programming effort here will be to make an efficient evaluation of the PID algorithm at a kilohertz. Parenthetically, I should say, I did not put a low-pass filter on when I was testing this, and the signal was quite noisy at high frequency. Now, high frequency is where the derivative is high, right? So the, the noise on the signal was dominating the first derivative of the angle measurement so that the differential term became junk and I couldn't stabilize the system. <clears throat> I hacked together a workaround and I'm not sure why I did this rather than just build the circuit. But I hacked together a workaround, you know, a week of math will save you five minutes of building. And, uh, uh, and the workaround was to build a, a first derivative term that took an average over sev several samples. In other words, I did a spline fit first derivative, yes. So you basically just did a software low-pass filter? I did a software low-pass filter. Biased for the first derivative, right? In other words, I fit a straight line. You fit a straight line through the point and you get, that's, a, that's the best fit to a, a first derivative. That. That's a low-pass filter. It is an averager. Is the noise low enough? I don't know. I didn't build this piece. You may have to do a little bit of both. But this will help. So over the weekend, in your spare time, you could certainly play with the MATLAB simulation, look at various uh, PID uh, settings. You're going to want to, uh, starting on Monday or today, uh, build this arm. And I would say get the interrupt service routine running, get the displays running, so that you can do things like move the arm around by hand and watch the angles change so that you know it's all working. And then uh, one person could start working on the, uh, the, uh, the thread to input the parameters and somebody else could start working on the interrupt service routine to to get the PID algorithm, but you might want to wait on that until I talk about it on Monday. So any questions? I just can't wait to have a whole room full of these things running at 14,000 RPM. Whereas the crickets were kind of pleasing, this sounds more like a room full of dentist drills. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we, uh, during a, a, a demo, uh, are we going to have to undergo a push from an outside force call? Just oh, so, so, so I was, I, I may do that, yes. I mean, I was thinking it would be fun to come in and hang a weight on this thing. Bink. 
uh, after when it's hovering at zero, put a weight on it, see how much it deflects and how accurate it is. I, I'm not sure about that. I, this is already complicated enough. <clears throat> I mean, the whole point of feedback, is you, as you're inferring, is to make the system uh, robust against perturbing. And uh, another possibility, we'll let, have this thing hovering at, at zero and, and just tap it and, and make sure that it comes back to the same level or how fast it comes back to the same level. Okay, that's the same code I put in lab two and lab three. Right? Remember there was an ISR time measurement? That's how you get the CPU load. So if, if, you have a, if you're calling this thing a thousand times a second, and you find that it's taking three quarters of a millisecond to execute your algorithm, then the CPU load is about 75%. And realistically, you have to ask yourself, how much CPU do you, do you need left over to run the TFT at, a, at a, an acceptable rate? That is going to determine how much of the CPU you can use to calculate the PID algorithm. Kilohertz is... 5,000 CPU cycles, one kilohertz, no. No, it's 40,000 CPU cycles. You might well be able to do this in floating point. But it might not work. I didn't try that. I started out with fixed point and realized I didn't need it because all of the integers you need are scaled to the PWM min and max. The PWM min is, of course, zero duty cycle. The max depends on how fast you're running the timer. The timer, in this case, is running at a one millisecond timeout. That's 40,000 counts. Therefore, the maximum value for the, for the PWM is 39,999. 40,000 minus one. That means you're going to scale all of your integers to 40,000. 40,000 is full scale. So that's five places of dynamic range for integers. That's probably enough for any reasonable calculation. And I didn't bother to use decimals because it was enough. 40,000 resolution was high enough. But I'll talk about that on Monday, the details. <coughs> There's a few quirky details you have to worry about. Any more questions? I had a good deal of fun making this work. Uh, it, uh, how I spent my summer vacation. Uh, actually, it's about two weeks. And that included figuring out how to build the beam because I started out with a rather complicated system. And if any of you read the web page description during the summer, you, you're probably glad now that it's simpler. I was using uh, automotive cement to, to glue a, a uh, automotive epoxy to glue a small piece of of brass tubing onto the dial and then force fitting the beam through that and doing all kinds of picky little operations that I realized I didn't want to do and I surely didn't want it to be done 40 times because we would have everything glued to everything else with that, with that automotive epoxy. It's as hard as steel. So I um, spent a lot of time simplifying it and playing around and trying to figure out how to put it together. It's a couple of weeks. You want to see the video again? Shoot. Sure. Let's see if we can. See if it'll actually. Yeah. It's a third of a sequence of design videos for a new lab. In this one, I've been playing with the PID coefficients, trying to tune up the PID 
by adding a large derivative term and increasing the integral term a little bit so that the response is better. And the test sequence is a sequence of four steps, which we can see when I flip the power on on the microcontroller. The system is commanded to come to vertical horizontal, then to plus 30 degrees, then minus 30 degrees, then back to horizontal. Now let's look at the oscilloscope for the same sequence. Going to turn off the power again. Now start it up. We'll get to the beginning of the screen and you'll see the command sequence coming up to the position trace on the top, then the new position at plus 30, the new position at minus 30, and the position back at horizontal. So the uh, system is, is close to critical damping. Looks pretty good. I don't even remember. Let's see what the earlier ones look like. I think they were a, a good deal less. I want to show you a prototype lab I'm thinking about for my micro. And also. This is, oh, this is the angle. small knob with Bondo on it. Yeah, there we go. And no, you don't want that. The control system consists of a pick. The, the target angle that's been chosen is horizontal. So if we start the controller, we see a few oscillations. See, that was significantly untuned the, relative to the other one. See how slow it's, the integral is bringing it up slowly. So the integral term is slowly getting rid of the last of the. Almost stable. And I think uh, this is going to be an interesting experiment for the students to do. Well, right, let's look at two. I'd like to talk a little bit more about this lab. Another video is a PIC32, but I've added the motor control parameter, PW resistor, which runs. We're going to see the transients on the oscilloscope of the motion. I tuned it a little bit so that it's, con it's, it's converging fairly well. Let's do that again, but try and capture the whole thing on the screen. And if we go over here and look at the steady state, we can see that this is perhaps 30 degrees above the horizontal. And it's pretty stable. The, uh, and fairly well damped. It's a little under damped still, but looks pretty good. So, and then by the third one, I had I'd figured out the damping and gotten it down to about uh, half a cycle. So any last minute questions? For the, yes? Uh, totally damn related, but um, we, um, sometime this week we submitted our um, homework five project proposals. Mm -hmm. What's the plan for um, having someone actually look at that and talk to us about them? So your, your, uh, your TA should get back to you by next lab. Uh, but if you want to come in and talk, I'm, I'll be around, I won't be around this afternoon. I got to drive to Maryland. But uh, Monday morning, I'll be back. Talk, talk to me anytime about your final project proposal. I'll be happy to hear it. Yes. Labs open this afternoon. It's a lab section. Yeah.